Good morning. It is indeed an honor to be back with you this morning, and I enjoy uh, and look forward to our time together. And uh, I want to jump right in because our time is short. My remit is to uh, talk for 40 minutes approximately, and then we'll have some questions and discussion uh, as you would like. The conference organizers have asked me to address the question of Adam in canonical perspective from within the Old Testament itself. If one means by this the reception of the figure of Adam presented in Genesis 1-5 to as it occurs in the rest of the Old Testament, this would be an exceedingly brief paper. Indeed, we begin by asking, where has Adam gone? As you all probably know, the noun Adam occurs 548 times. This is according to the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew. It depends on which resource you're using. I have not individually gone through and counted them all myself. 548 times for a, a noun, human being, humanity, people, <clears throat> approximately or only 22 of which mean the man or the personal name Adam and the opening chapters of the Bible. In addition, we can assume that we have Adam as a personal name only five times in Genesis, perhaps six, depending on one's exegesis. And so, Adam as a personal name does not occur at all in the rest of the Old Testament except for the single occurrence, oh, there you go, the references in Genesis 1 to 5, except for the single occurrence in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. And of course, you can see from that verse, we gain a lot of information about Adam in that genealogical list. And so maybe I should say, that's it, thanks for coming, that's my presentation, that's, that's the, thank you, John, that's, that's, that's Adam in Old Testament canonical perspective. Now, for this reason, my observations and comments this morning will be focused almost exclusively on Genesis 1 to 5, and especially the comparative material within the ancient Near East. Otherwise, we are working without a database to address the question. Now this morning I'd like to acknowledge two presuppositions or assumptions in, at work in this paper, both of which I assume should be accepted as axiomatic, although that may not be the case, and that's fine too. First, recent advances in science related to the Human Genome Sequencing Project have convincingly proven, that may be up for discussion, that Homo sapiens is not a biologically independent species, but that we share a common ancestry with other life forms on the planet. The facts of the science are considerably beyond my training and ability to articulate, and so I will leave it to others to explain them in all their pyrotechnic splendor. Uh, in lay person's terms, the facts appear to be these. Population genomic studies suggest that the species sapiens is descended from an estimated effective population size in the range of 10,000 individuals, most likely in East Africa approximately 100,000 years ago. The second assumption, and by the way, I will not even address that first assumption throughout the whole paper until the very end, in which I'll make, uh, try to make some conclusions and uh, offer some things for discussion. A second assumption at work <coughs> in this paper will seem considerably more pedestrian than the first one, and that is that, but yet just as important in our conversations. I assume we all share an agreement on the importance of accurate genre identification in biblical hermeneutics. Simply put, different genres have different communicative functions and so require specific methods of interpretation. <clears throat> Everyone would agree, I think, that one of the most important decisions one makes in reading the Bible is to identify at the outset precisely what genre of literature one is reading. A big part of what I'll be asking this morning is what exactly are we looking at in Genesis 1 to 5? And then we use proper interpretive strategies suitable to that genre. I am reminded of the mistake Israel's King David made when hearing Nathan's parable about the poor man and the ewe lamb. The persuasive power of the text is undeniable in 2 Samuel 12. Uh, as we see a prophet struggling with how exactly to challenge an ancient Near Eastern king with seemingly limitless power. How does one condemn David's actions without condemning oneself? Nathan brilliantly uses the emotional outrage generated by the thoughtless 
even heartless actions of the rich man, so that David immediately responds, he deserves to die. David is guilty of many things in this text, and this is uh, Angelica, Angelica Kaufman's David and Nathan, painted in 1797. David is guilty of many things in this extended narrative, of course. You know the story. Uh, we could begin the list of his sins and crimes. But among his shortcomings is his mistake to take David's parable for prose narrative. In fact, he appears to have mistaken the parable for a narrowly defined form that form critics have identified as a judicial case. Because David got the form wrong, he failed to get the point until Nathan's thundering words, you are the man. In this way, David was guilty of what was, has been labeled the fallacy of violation of genre. This paper returns again to the important question of genre in order to explore the characteristic features of Genesis 1 to 5 that we may need to be more attention, give more attention to in these discussions, and ultimately in an effort to aid us in avoiding the fallacy of genre violation. Now, the paper will proceed by focusing on the second of these premises, genre, the importance of identifying genre. Attempting to locate Genesis 1 to 5 in its ancient Near Eastern context in order to answer the question of literary genre. What exactly are we reading in Genesis 1 to 5? This involves a survey of the ancient Near Eastern text most relevant as a background for Genesis. The survey includes a discussion of the difficult question of the nature of myth and mythology and the function of etiology within ancient mythology. I'll make all of that very brief but try to give concise definitions as possible. This in turn leads to the next point in the paper, which is to explore the role of etiology in Genesis. And again, I'll give definitions in a few moments. And finally, a tentative conclusion that Genesis 1 to 5 may rightly be identified as mytho-history. This identification has several implications for our discussions. Most importantly, the idea that the first homo sapiens in the community of 10,000 individuals need not necessarily correspond to Ha-Adam in Genesis 1 to 4. And so first, the ancient Near Eastern mythology. And for this portion of the paper, I'm going to abbreviate quite a bit just to try to summarize some of these things for you. Uh, we learn in Hermeneutics 101 that every text must be read in, and interpreted in light of its literary context, both its immediate and canonical context. With regard to immediate context... We specifically turn to the verses that immediately precede and follow the passages under investigation. And I would add especially those verses and paragraphs in the context immediately preceding the pericope. But herein we come straight, straight away to the uniqueness of Genesis 1 with its elegant prose, more akin to poetry, describing the beginning of everything except God who has no beginning. As striking and profound as these features are, the uniqueness of Genesis 1 lies not in these features, but in the simple fact, and maybe this is too obvious to say out loud, but the simple fact that Genesis 1 has no immediately preceding context. Obviously then, Genesis 1 is the only passage of the biblical canon read from a Christian perspective, even Matthew 1 has a preceding context, which does not, Genesis 1 does not have an immediately preceding context. Therefore, the ancient Near Eastern background for Genesis 1 is even more important than usual in the process of interpretation. In a way, the ancient cosmogonies of Egypt and Mesopotamia become the interpretive context for Genesis 1. Now, for our purposes, I will only summarize 22 or 23 texts in Sumerian, Akkadian, Egyptian, and Ugaritic that deal with these issues and that summarize, that provide a background for Genesis 1. So one of the most intractable difficulties in the interpretation of all of these texts over the past century or so has been the definition of myth and mythology, including the essential elements of myth and the origins of myth and the function of mythography in ancient thought. Ancient myth has the power to conjure in the mind of the reader a litany of associations to create meaningful meaning to create meaning without an assertion or a definitive pattern. And so in some way, one can assert that the mythic themes of all of these ancient texts 
derive their force precisely from the fact that they suggest rather than explain, that they constitute cores of meaning by association without having been put together in a definitive pattern. They function as foundation stones for certain basic assumptions in the life of the community or a person. Without getting into the details here, it should be clear that the myth-making of the ancient Near Eastern texts has certain theoretical features evident in these texts from all uh, of the ancient Near East, all over the ancient Near East. But I would like to add a literary feature that I have come to believe is so central to the role and function of ancient mythology that it cannot fall into the category of an inconsequential literary device and looms as too central to receive so little attention in the literature. Nearly all of the texts on creation from the ancient Near East can be said to have this ideological dimension. Now, <clears throat> again, for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize some of what I'd like to say in this next few slides. <clears throat> when you go through these 23 texts from the ancient world that talk about the beginning of the cosmos or the beginning of human beings, the beginning of life on the planet, they all share certain features and interest in etiologies, etiology being a, an account to give explanation for why things are the way they are. Humans throughout history, we believe, have asked this question. Uh, who are we? Why are we here? How did we get here? What's the origin of all of this? In almost all of these texts from across the Fertile Crescent in all these different languages deal with the ascendancy of deities, trying to explain Enlil over Enki, two of the primary deities of ancient Sumer, the rise of Marduk in, in ancient East Semitic culture, the rise of Baal in, uh, in West Semitic culture, or the ascendancies of cities, and these are related, Nippur and Eridu over Enlil and Enki, or the rise of Babylon, connected, of course, to the rise of Marduk, Heliopolis and Memphis. The, the ascendancies of the cities have to be explained in some way, and the myths were told partly to explain why those cities played the role that they played in the culture. Other features of the ancient cosmog cosmogonies, its structure, the, the cosmosis structure, the source of water supply, different, it, it's so many different myths in different languages and different cultures are all trying to explain, well, why is water here and not there? And how does it work? And how do we gain and keep access to it? The existence of birth effects in humans and in animals or premature births, cycles of nature. These myths were told to explain these things to humans and help them understand these things. And of course, primary among all of these myths, the origins of the cosmos itself and especially the mortality of humanity. Now, in the Semitic world, oh, I have to watch my time. I don't get too much into this. But in the Semitic world, that's told in the Gilgamesh epic, which is not included in these texts necessarily. In Genesis, of course, it is included in the primeval history. In fact, the question of mortality is dealt with in Genesis 3 in a very different way than it is in the Gilgamesh epic. So we're including this question of mortality of humanity also in the opening, Genesis, uh, opening chapters of Genesis. So more detail could be summarized here, but I hope this brief survey illustrates that the central function of myth in the ancient world is ideological, and not merely as a genre, a, a generic feature of ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic texts, but as the essential means of theologizing and thinking about life in the ancient world. In short, mythology lay at the very foundations of a general ancient Near Eastern ideology and its ideational substance was etiology, or giving account of why things are the way they are. Now, very briefly, um, I'll summarize all of that with this slide. Etiology is a central literary feature of ancient mythology to provide the foundations. Now, secondly, etiology in Genesis. With this background of the etiological nature of ancient Near Eastern mythology, we turn now to Genesis in order to ask what the role of etiology plays there. First, it may be helpful to note that scholars have explored this feature of biblical literature in detail, resulting in a number of useful definitions. For example, etiology may be defined as a narrative designed in its basic structure to support some kind of explanation for a situation or name that exists at the time of the author. The term itself then, etiology, may apply to any narrative giving the past historical reason for a present reality, that is, the present of the author. And it is 
purely a descriptive term. The, the literature also has <clears throat> a debate including uh, between scholars such as James Barr and Alan Millard about what implications the presence of an etiology has for the historicity of the text. And before I go further, let me say that I agree with Alan Millard that the presence of etiology as a feature of a narrative does not mean it's not historical. That doesn't perhaps need to be said, but it actually does need to be said in the way it's uh, discussed in the literature. So it doesn't mean it's ahistorical or unhistorical. The Bible's first chapter is dominated by ideological interests. Here the reader learns such essential as, such essentials as why day turns to night and night to day in a seemingly ceaseless cycle of common human experience, how the dome fixed above prevents catastrophic flooding, why the earth sprouts vegetation, how the sun and moon establish the four seasons as well as Israel's festival calendar, why the world has such varieties of plants and animals and why they are so fruitful, why humans are unique in that created order in male and female genders, and why all of creation is so very good. Along the way, the reader learns how certain of these elements are named, day, night, sky, earth, and seas. And above all, the etiologies of Genesis 1 explain why it is that the seventh day is holy and to be honored by all of Israel. It is hard to avoid the conclusion that Genesis 1 is first and foremost an etiologically driven account. The etiologies continue throughout the primeval history all the way through chapter 11. Among the essential features of the universe given etiological explanation in Genesis 2 are why humans return to dust when they die, implicitly because they come from dust in 2 verse 7, why humans are distinct from animals, how men and women relate to each other, how creatures receive their names, and as Genesis 1 culminated in an ideological explanation for the institution of Sabbath, so Genesis 2 concludes with the social institution of marriage, 2 verse 24. The great transgression of Genesis 3, of course, culminates in important etiologies as well. Serpentine lo locomotion, human hatred of snakes, pain in childbirth, the nature of life and work. Above all, the text explains the inevitability of death, just as many of the ancient Near Eastern myths were interested in human mortality. And the reader learns here as well why humans wear animal skins for clothing and will never find re-entry to the paradisaical perfection that was Eden prior to the transgression. In addition, we have an ideological naming of Eve and Seth. Much of the rest of the primeval history goes on in a similar fashion, but perhaps the most intensely ideological is Enoch's birth announcement in 4, verses 7 to 24, which includes the concentrated form and concentrated form explanations of the first human cultural institutions, urbanization, pastoral agriculture, music, and metallurgy. I could continue all the way through chapter 11, but I'm limiting myself here as much as possible to chapter 1 to 5, and limited also by the clock. The role of etiology in Genesis should not be surprising in light of the ancient Near Eastern parallels and the centrality of etiology in those texts. And yet the problem is the degree to which Genesis is similar and dissimilar to these parallels. Genesis 1 to 5 especially is similar to the parallels we have surveyed in the ancient Near East. But before turning to a concluding proposal, it is important to realize that the ideological accounts of creation in the ancient Near Eastern parallels locate the important paradigmatic details, whether related to the role of cities like Nippur and Eridu, the prominence of rivers and water canals, or the hierarchy of the divine pantheon. They're all located in the mythic past. Strikingly, the ideologies of Genesis are located in time and space created by God at the beginning and subsequent events of Israel's national history. In fact, the survey of the use of etiologies in both Israel and in the other ancient Near Eastern cultures may be instructive to reveal how their worldviews differ more generally. I have suggested that mythology in ancient cultures serves to suggest rather than to explain using powerful mythic themes to erect foundational stones for the basic assumptions of life in the community. <clears throat> 
By contrast, Israel's mytho-history, if we may call it that for the moment, does much more, intentionally explaining in a definitive historical pattern what the community needs for rightly relating to Yahweh. But the contrast goes deeper once we consider the use of ideology in Israel compared to the ancient world. The ideology of the ancient Near Eastern literature routinely locates causal forces in the mythical actions of deities in which divine decrees are set in force for all time. Even in chronographic texts from ancient Mesopotamia, the line of causation reaches back beyond history to the divine realm where reality is established in that divine realm. By contrast, the narratives of Genesis, of Genesis are primarily concerned with maintaining the blessings of the covenant, assuming a causal line reaching back not into a mythic past, but reaching back to a particular moment in Israel's history. That is why keep the festival becomes primary over all other rituals in Exodus 12, in both testaments, if I may say. Keep the festival. Reality for Israel is established. Reality for Israel is established in the events of the Exodus and covenant at Sinai rather than in the realm of myth or in the mythic past. Thus, ideology is no less important in Genesis, but it serves a very different purpose. And that leads me then to my third portion of the paper, history, mytho-history. And um, I have a pun for this rest of this title, which I'll share with you in a few moments. I'm going to save it for a little punchline. This brings us back to the question of genre in the 21st century reading of Genesis. In order to avoid the fallacy of genre violation when reading Genesis, we need to give more attention to the unique nature of Genesis 1 to 5. There can be no question that, the ancient, that ancient Israel was committed to historiography as a primary means of doing theology. They did theology by writing history. However, the opening chapters of Genesis describe characters and events in a world dramatically different from our own. A world with talking serpents, with life before cities, before agriculture, before music or metallurgy. A world in which humans are unified with one language and much more. Given the similarities between ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic literature and Genesis, perhaps our starting point should be the observation that even in Israel, in Israel's cosmogony, the default form of literary presentation is narrative. Almost immediately, after presenting these three circumstantial clauses describing the state of the cosmos in verse 1, and then in verse 2, the text picks up immediately in verse 3 the narrative technique that is ubiquitous in Old Testament discourse, the use of the vav consecutive with the prefix verbs, the so-called past narrative. If you have Hebrew, I've added this for your benefit, so those of you who are students in the room can say, okay, I put all those hours into learning this now. Finally, you get to see it. You see here, vayomer Elohim, yehi or, let there be light, and then it says, vayhi or. So the vayomer is followed just a few words later by vayhi. This is a standard way of telling a narrative, which is, as I say, ubiquitous in the Old Testament historical books. This narrative technique drives the account forward in typical Israelite fashion for writing history. Just as we cannot deny the literary realities in Genesis 1 to 5, we also cannot deny that historiography, or something very like it, was Israel's default venue for doing theology. And so we cannot deny that the people, places, and events of the primeval history generally, that is Genesis 1 to 11, cannot be considered verifiable history in a way that we think about today. These chapters are devoted to the origins of the cosmos, similar, as we've seen, to ancient Near Eastern mythology. And so we cannot expect to find traces, historical traces here. But literarily, the arrangement of these themes in Genesis 1 to 5 have been placed along a time continuum continuum using cause and effect in a way that also cannot be categorized as mythology in the same way as the ancient parallels. This is simply not myth and myth writing as we have seen in the 23 texts by comparison in the ancient world. While one advocating for an, I am not advocating for an entirely new genre. My friends in hermeneutics tell me this is not something that we are free to do to simply create a new category. The categories are there, and we discern them, but we don't create new categories for them. So we're not creating a new genre. 
I prefer to think of Genesis 1 to 5 as an innovative use of myth or at least of mythic themes to tell a new story more in line with Israel's worldview. And so a narrative venue was chosen, Vayomir and Vayhi. This innovation has been called, I think not inappropriately so, mytho-history or mytho-historical is the adjective using the prefix mytho to draw attention to the fact that this is not historiography in any form we might imagine it today, but is dealing with themes and topics we expect in ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic mythology. So it's dealing with themes and topics that we expect to find in mythology. These themes and topics have been transformed significantly in Israel's telling. The identification of Genesis 1 to 5 as mytho-historical literature in no way identifies these materials as myth or mythical, but draws attention to the way themes previously regarded simply as mythological are arranged along a historical timeline causing, using cause and effect. In light of the emphasis I have put on etiology in this paper, in both ancient Near Eastern mythology and Israelite mytho-history, I need here to offer a cautionary word. The heavy concentration of etiology in these portions of Genesis that I have categorized as mytho-historical does not settle the intractable problem of the historicity of Adam and Eve. Uh, before I get to this concluding point that we all have such intense interest in, I have uh, skipped over for the sake of time the way etiologies continue from chapters 5 all the way through chapter 11 and indeed in the ancestral narratives. So why are certain places given names? Why are certain wells given names? You know the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, why are the, there are many things. Why names are hugely important in ancestral narratives. But as you move through Genesis, etiology becomes less and less a critical feature in 12 to 36 and almost disappears entirely in the Joseph story. So if you think about the frame of Genesis, it's etiology as a literary feature is intensely concentrated in the opening chapters of the book, continues to be used in the ancestral narratives, and disappears in the Joseph narrative. It's also a feature later on in historical narratives of the Old Testament, but not as prominent as they are in what we're calling mytho-historical material here. Now to this important question of historicity uh, of the, the man and his wife in the opening chapters. The point is that this history writing is very different from historiography we get even in the Old Testament itself. When the Israelites went back to the time before their ancestral traditions to give an account of their understanding of the cosmos, of anthropology, of the human condition, etc., they needed a cosmogony that did for them what mythology did for their neighbors. And it is precisely the nature of Genesis 1 to 5 as mytho-historical discourse that leaves us today with so many questions. Given these literary features in Genesis, I understand why many interpreters today assume that none of this material has any grounding in historical realia. But I also caution that the understanding proposed here, that of an intensely ideological quality in Israel's mytho-historical presentation, does not preclude an historical reality behind the discourse. I am not driven to an unhistorical reading of the text by these observations. So then, what is one to make of Adam in the opening chapters of Genesis? <clears throat> the Genesis account moves gradually from generic references to the human, Ha'adam, to the introduction of the first use as a personal name, Adam, at the birth announcement of Seth in chapter 4, verse 25. Prior to this point in the discourse, <clears throat> excuse me, it is used as a common noun. Perhaps just here is, our <clears throat> is where our discussion would benefit from our uncoupling of Homo sapiens from Adam. And so we raise the question, must Adam be Homo sapiens individual? Or, putting this a different way, can we talk about splitting the atom? <laughs> We're waiting for that moment. <clears throat> so the first Homo sapiens in the community of 10,000, as I said in my two opening assumptions and promised to come back to the first of these, 
the first homo sapiens in the community of 10,000 individuals do not necessarily correspond to Ha'adam in the text, who becomes Adam, capital A, in the text. And this appears to be the direction N.T. Wright proposed in 2014, and here I have an extended quote from Tom Wright. So follow along with me. Just as God chose Israel from the rest of humankind for a special, strange, demanding vocation, so perhaps what Genesis is telling us is that God chose one pair from the rest of early hominids for a special, strange, demanding vocation. This pair, and then Tom added, call them Adam and Eve if you like, were to be the representatives of the whole human race, the ones in whom God's purpose to make the whole world a place of delight and joy and order, eventually colonizing the whole creation, was to be taken forward. God the Creator put into their hands the fragile task of being His image bearers. If they fail, they would bring the whole purpose for the wider creation, including all the non-chosen hominids, down with them. They were supposed to be the life bringers, and if they fail in their task, the death that is already endemic in the world as it is will engulf them as well. The interesting thing about the quote is the way he compares the role of Adam and Eve as historical individuals, if you wish, to the role of Israel as the chosen people through whom God brought salvation to the world. Indeed, this is not entirely unlike the approach of Karl Barth, who rejects any distinction between the Christian God and creation itself. The opposition between the authority of God and God's word on the one hand and creation and the creature's words on the other. At the heart of the debate is an adversarial depiction of the creator and creation, or an assumption of opposition between knowledge supplied by the creator and that supplied by creation, or between objective observ observations of revelation and the conjectural inferences of modern science. Specific to the creation of the Adam in Genesis 1, Bart focuses on a Christocentric hermeneutic focusing on incarnation as event, which ultimately defines humanity and not as any given quality defined by creation. The distinction between humanity and animals is the continuing action of God to identify God's self as Savior and Lord in a concrete person. What makes us human, then, is not something instilled at creation with a discrete first atom imparting a rational soul at a discrete moment in time, that moment in which anthropos was achieved, but man becomes a living soul as God breathes the breath of life into his nostrils. In this most direct and most spatial act, to no beast does God turn in this way. It is this face-to-face -face intimacy that God defines his own triune supremacy, as well as establishes, establishes the trajectory in which humanity comes to be what it is. Bart rejects an undialectical opposition between the Christian God and creation. This God, Emmanuel, is with us, and God's self-giving self real, real, relationality of his triune life is not an abstraction that is secondary to the incarnation, but is inevitably realized in the incarnation. Bart is able both to affirm humanity's common descent and its specialness as God's image bearer. He requires no mysterious agency guiding anthropological development to a designated end state because it is the action of God toward humanity in whatever state of existence that secures its uniqueness. It is therefore only in the face-to-face -face between God and Adam that we begin to the Bible's salvation history. That part, a summary of Bart, and I know we don't, uh, well, we'll leave that on the table where it is, but I just wanted to put him and Wright to, side by side for your uh, edification. Finally, this relates to the nature of Scripture. In a hermeneutical move that cannot be fully addressed in this presentation, the debate is also partly driven by our impulse to read the Bible epistemologically as a source of truth instead of soteriologically as a means of grace. In closing, I would suggest that our conversation around these issues would be somewhat different were we to embrace the Bible not primarily as though it were inspired for us to know things but according to its primary function in and for the church, inspired as it is for Christians to know God 
through personal and corporate salvation. That is, to read it soteriologically. Now, I would anticipate your questions by saying, that's the end of my paper, but I would anticipate your questions by saying, no, I don't see them as diametrically opposite, epistemology and soteriology. But I think it has to do with our stance and how we're facing Scripture and what we're doing primarily as we read Scripture. Thank you. Thank you.